Hi, everyone. So today we're going to continue with our story, Airborne by Kenneth Oppel. Our goal today is I can analyze literary elements, including character, setting, and plot. So you might remember from our last module, thinking about literary elements. So literary elements are the components that an author uses to make a story really come to life. So they're the pieces that make up the story. It includes the characters, which are the people and the animals in a story. So we can make inferences about characters based on what they're doing and how the author describes them. The author will also include a setting, which is where and when the story takes place. They also will include a plot, which is the conflict or the problem that the characters face. And they'll also have a resolution, how the problem is solved. And then there are also events within the story that can change a character, that can affect the mood, and that can really build the plot. So today, what I'd like you to start out with is by opening up your Into Reading books to our story Airborne. So it starts on um, page 89 and 90. And so the very first thing that I'd like you to do is think about where in the story can you find about the setting? So think about where the author might include information about the setting. So what I'd like you to do is you're going to look through pages 90 to 94, and you're going to underline parts where you find evidence of the setting. So remember that the setting is where and when the story takes place. So you're going to look for where the author includes information about the setting and you're going to underline in your book. And right next to it, you're gonna take a note and put setting. The next thing that I'd like you to do is start thinking about what information can we get about the characters. So I want you to start taking notes in your book from page 90 to 94 about the characters, the people and the animals in the story. So think about what kind of information has the author already given to us in this section. So yesterday, we left off on page 93. And our main character, had just read a journal entry that was telling us that Captain Malloy had seen this island and he thought that there were albatross that were flying around it. And then he reads this sentence in paragraph 14 where it says, not birds. So as he's reading this, I wonder what the main character has realized. This makes me think of an aha moment. He's been reading all of this information and now he realizes that Captain Malloy did not see birds, but he sees something that's huge and flying. I wonder how this will change things. I kind of wonder if they're not birds, what do you think that he might be seeing? If we take a look at this picture, what could it be? It sent a tingle through me. Those two words. I had to look up from the book. I, am I imagined Benjamin Malloy peering through his spyglass, his hand tightening around the gondola's rim. What was it he'd seen that told him these creatures weren't birds? Their wings are not feathered. I was mistaken about their beaks. They have none. Considerably bigger than either magnificent frigate bird or albatross. One of the creatures broke from the flock and made a slow circle of the endurance, quite high at first, then spiraling down closer to the gondola. It seemed very curious. Its body is easily six feet in length and closely furred. Its forelegs seem to turn seem to turn into wings like a bat's, with a single protruding claw at the wing's leading edge, the span I would estimate as eight or nine feet across. 
Its rear legs are stubby, but with wickedly sharp curved claws. I feared for the balloon. Should he collide with it, how can such a creature stay aloft? It looks too heavy. It is fiercely agile in the sky, dipping and spinning and diving with ease. Its wings infinitely versatile. It fairly seemed to leap through the air. Saw scarcely anything of its face. A gleam of sizable incisors on upper and lower jaws. A flash of intelligent, green-flecked eyes that it veered off, hurtling back toward its fellows. An undiscovered species? I turned the page and there was a picture, a pencil sketch. Just looking at it made my heart flutter. I had to sit up and catch my breath. He'd put the rim of the basket in the foreground and the silhouette of the island in the background to give a sense of scale. The creature's wingspan was huge. He was a deft hand, the grandfather, that was certain. Couldn't have had much time to get it down, but his lines were swift and assured. It was the strangest looking thing. Half bird, half panther. September 4th, 1325. I have dropped into a calmer stratum of air so I can hover over the island and observe them. They float. They face into the wind and scarcely need beat their wings. I watched one move not a muscle for hours sleeping maybe, bedded down on the air itself. They cannot weigh much. So as we read this section, I want us to think about the element of characters. So as we're reading the narration, which is the part that is written in just standard font, which character are we learning more about? So you're, I'd like you to look through the story and determine who is narrating this story. And then when we look at these journal entries, we're learning about a different character. So what I'd like you to do is you're going to take notes on the side of this page about what you can learn about each character. Across the next two pages were drawings of skeletons. The first one was human. I saw that clearly enough. The rib cage, the hips, the skull atop the neck. Next to it was a skeleton that looked at first glance not so much, so not so very much different, except the hands. The bones of the fingers were long and flared. It was freakish to look at until I read Benjamin Malloy's caption underneath. That. Next to this was a third skeleton, and it seemed some sort of bizarre combination of the two. Shortened legs, like the bat, and instead of arms, the same weirdly flared finger bones of the bat. But the skull on this one was no bat's, nor was it human. The skull was flatter, with sharp teeth. Smaller, yes, but certainly no one would mistake this for a bat, and never for a bird. The drawings were made with scientific care, all shaded and with a, length of with a length scale to the side. He was a clever man, Kate's grandpa, no questioning that. Seemed to know something about everything. Underneath were all sorts of Latin words. So what I'd like you to do is think about why did the illustrator include these images? What can we learn about Captain Malloy from these two drawing pages? So what I'd like you to do is on page 96, you're going to write, what did you learn about Captain Malloy by looking at the pages of his journal? September 5th, 915. Still playing the air currents around the island so I can watch them. They have a great curiosity for my balloon, circling high but rarely drawing too close to the gondola. Difficult for me to see their bodies or faces more clearly. They seem wary of me. The sight of my spyglass makes them scatter in an instant. I wonder why. With a start, 
I realized that these creatures could have been responsible for damaging his balloon. Had they tested the material with their sharp claws, torn enough little gashes to make it sink? Ooh, that sounds kind of like an aha moment. So our narrator is starting to learn more pieces of information. How might that change the story? I wonder what he'll do with this information. 1747, they do not land. In all the time I've been observing, they haven't landed in the trees or on the water. They feed low over the island, preying on all manner of birds. They are voracious hunters. They also eat fish, strafing the water and plunging their rear claws into the sea as they break. They come up with small fish or squid. They lift them high, then flip them up into their mouths and take them whole. Sometimes they drop their prey and then dive down and snatch it into their mouths. September 6th, 1117. I have counted 26 of the creatures. I wish Kate could see them. The way they gamble and swirl through the air. I've never seen an animal look so at home in its element. Like dolphins or porpoises or whales, they clearly love to play. Why has no one ever seen these before? Their natural camouflage is excellent. But with so many airships aloft now, surely someone else must have seen these creatures? Or are they very few? Are these the only ones in existence? On the next page was another sketch of a great flock or herd, I wasn't sure what to call them, of these things circling over the coast of of the island. September 7th, 1340. They birth in the air. One after another, one of the creatures, female, I now realize, would soar to a great altitude, 7,000 feet or so. I increased my lift so that I could rise with them and keep watch. The female put her head to the wind and angled her wings so she was hovering. Then something dropped from her hindquarters. It happened so quickly, all I was aware of was a small dark bundle plunging away from her. At first, I thought it was merely her droppings, but I quickly realized it was too large, and the female's behavior was most curious. Immediately, she went into a dive too keeping pace with the falling object. The object wobbled in the air and seemed to enlarge, even as it fell past me. It was spreading its wings. It was no bigger than a kitten. But its wings, as they unfurled, were many times the width of its body. Out went the wings, instinctively angled so that the newborn's plunge began to slow dramatically. After a moment or two, I saw the wings lift and push tentatively, then again and again, each time with more force. It was flying. From the moment of birth, it knew how. How could such a thing be possible? Incredible. But then, does not the newborn whale, born into the element of water, know instantly how to swim? Why could it not be so with this creature then? Only air and not water was its element. The mother flew close alongside its child, as if giving advice, monitoring its progress. I watched more females make the climb to the birthing altitude and then release their newborns into the air. September 8th. 1251. All are feeding today with new kinds of urgency. Are they on some kind of migration? I wonder where they're going. Where they come from? I suppose the sky is their home. They need no terrestrial haven. Perhaps they simply move from hemisphere to hemisphere, looking for the warmest skies, and the birthing season coincides with the arrival in southern latitudes. 1935. They're departing, would like to follow, but they're too fast. With tailwinds, I would estimate 80 knots. Amazing creature. Gone now, weather changing. Mm. 
Maybe it was me, but I thought he sounded pretty dejected. When I turned the page, I felt a bit queasy. Most of the handwriting was smeared, by torrential rain, I supposed, and I could make out only a few words. It seemed a tropical storm had overtaken him and kept him in its fist for some time. I think I saw the word damage in one entry and a mention of a problem with the envelope. A hot flush swept my back. Was he leaking? Had the creatures torn his balloon or was it just the storm? Benjamin Malloy had stopped dating his entries and his coordinates and weather observations seemed half-hearted now. His handwriting was all tilted. The letters slewed, slewing into one another. I remembered that we'd found him on September 13th, so that left five days after his last dated entry. I wonder if wondered if he'd fallen if he if I wondered if he'd now fallen ill, too weak to repair his ship or keep his log properly. There were some more sketches of the creatures, and then suddenly the sketches became stranger, covering more and more pages. Creatures with the faces of lions or eagles or women. Creatures with human faces and furred bodies and wings that not even not fully extended dwarfed their bodies. These were imaginings, surely, for they were so different from his earlier sketches, but drawn with such detail, you'd have thought he'd had them right before his eyes. There was only one more written entry in the log. Airship in the distance will signal for help. I looked for the date, but found none. It must have been the Aurora he'd sighted, but I'd certainly seen no signal from his gondola. I stared at the last page for a while, the final words, the nothingness after it, and it got me feeling strange. So I had to close the book. I felt a keen disappointment. It was hard to know what to make of it all. At first, the log had been so clear and reasonable, but by the end, especially with those pictures, it seemed he was dreaming. When did the real end and the conjurings of a disturbed mind begin? It was pushing two in the morning now, and I felt thoroughly ill at ease. I put the book on the shelf and eventually slept. So I want you to think about what have we learned about Captain Malloy from the beginning of the journal entries to the journal entries that um, Matt Cruz is reading currently. What is the big problem that he seems to be facing? <laughs> 